Hello, everybody, and welcome to our September webinar. This month, we are pleased to present a discussion on building workflows with the Drupal's Rules module. The Drupal Rules module provides support for an island or installation to act to act actions taken by users or processes. It also allows administrators to define actions based on occurring events. Discovery Garden developer Dan Aiken returns this month to lead the discussion. As you all are aware, QA Dan is very well known in the Island Door community and has been involved with a number of projects in many capacities for a number of years. I want to let you all know that we're going to be recording this webinar and we'll be sending out a link to access it later on today as per usual. So my name is Adam Smith. Uh, I'm in sales here at Discovery Garden. I joined the team in 2015 and I have quickly become immersed in a broad range of different Island Aura projects. As always, as I always like to say, I've dealt with many of you online here today, um, but for those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, I look forward to doing so in the near future. As always, we are going to start with an overview of Island Aura and Discovery Garden, which will then lead into the introduction of our guest speaker, Dan Aiken who's going to lead us through the discussion on building workflows with the Drupal Rules module. Following Dan's presentation, as always, we're going to open the floor to any questions. As your mics will be muted, um, I'll ask that you type your questions in the chat window, and I'll gladly read them out loud during the Q&A session. The Islandora open source technology stack consists of three core components, being Drupal, Apache Solar, and Fedora Commons. Now, the stack also includes a lot of utility components and dependencies as well which makes Islandora a very large open source software stack and it includes many applications. So in essence, the developers of Islandora and the community that supports it are experts at integrating third party tools into Islandora. So let's, take, let's talk a little bit about the core components individually. And as always, we'll start with Drupal. So many of you are familiar with Drupal. It's the leading, source, lead, leading open source content management system. It has over 30,000 user contributed modules uh, from almost 100,000 active community members or developers. Uh, as you know, active community members are vital to any open source project, and the same can be said for Drupal. People are invested in Drupal, and that leads to ongoing development and ultimately success. So Drupal serves as the presentation layer within Islandora. It's how we create a website and how we expose it to the internet. Uh, we also use Drupal for collaboration. It has a great framework for users, roles, and permissions. And we use that for workflow activities, and it really does integrate well with a lot of other functionality within Islandora. So Islandora, in essence, is a suite of Drupal modules that allow us to build repositories on top of Fedora Commons. Now, these modules make it possible to build, populate, and configure a digital repository without the aid of a developer. So next is Apache Solar. Apache Solar is used for discovery within Islandora. Solar is very powerful, very flexible, and very config configurable and it's used on some of the most heavily trafficked websites and applications worldwide. Uh, some key features of Solar include full text searching, uh, search faceting and filtering. It's highly scalable and fault tolerant, and it provides near real-time indexing. For example, if we ingest an object into Islandora, it's going to be indexed within Solar almost immediately, and it will become searchable probably within 30 seconds after ingest. The final core component is Fedora Commons. Now, this is the layer that stores and preserves all of our digital content. Uh, Fedora Commons is pur purpose-built for data preservation and long-term data accessibility. And some key features of Fedora Commons include auditing and fixity checks, RDF, XML support. Uh, we're able to scale Fedora to Commons to millions of objects. It has support for virtually any file type, and it's built for interoperability. That means you can export or migrate your data in a format so that it can be stored elsewhere should you choose. So as mentioned, uh, those three core components make up the open source technology framework. And we like to call it a framework as it really is the integration of components working together. Now organizations all over the world are using the Islandora framework, framework to build their repositories. Some of these instances are customized in order to meet specific needs, and some are not customized as the software is very usable out of the box. People are scaling these repositories into the millions of objects, and they continue to have these large repositories perform very well. So Islandora helps create fast, usable sites that are meeting customers' expectations worldwide. So let's take a quick look into some of the types and kinds of organizations that are using Islandora. 
So library and academics, uh, universities, academic libraries, academic departments, and individual scholars or researchers use Islandora for digital curation. Uh, some examples being the University of Manitoba, uh, UCLA, Cal Poly, Boston College, the University of Missouri, and many, many more. It's used by uh, people in the museum and cultural world. Um, that includes the Baseball Hall of Fame, which we just did a, a large release on, uh, the New York Historical Society, Adventist Digital Library, and as well, many, many more. Nonprofit organizations and government also use Islandora for the curation of digital assets. Uh, that includes the USDA, Smithsonian, uh, Presbyterian Historical Society, and the list continues to grow and grow. So these types of organizations are using Islandora because they're dealing with more and more data every year, and it's often growing at exponential rates. So as the data, data volume grows, it becomes harder to manage, access, and preserve. So the solution is developing a digital curation process that includes an Islandora digital repository. Organizations can create robust digital repository systems tailored to their specific needs and grow the system to handle virtually limitless amount of data. So now let's move on to a very quick overview of how Discovery Garden fits into the picture. Discovery Garden is a service provider of Islandora, so we work to remove barriers to using the open source technology. We launched in 2010 and we are a partner in the Islandora Foundation, which is a nonprofit entity that fosters the Islandora code. So since we've launched, we've contributed to over 90% of the Islandora code base, which we've written here at Discovery Garden on behalf of our many customers. So we offer a lot of services that relate to an Islandora repository. A complete list of our services can be found on our website, and I'll include a link to that page in the follow-up package that I'll send out later on today. Okay, so now on to the main event. Uh, as I mentioned, it's my pleasure to introduce Dan Aiken. Uh, Dan was with us last month, and it was very well received. Dan is a developer at, here at Discovery Garden and has uh, many years of experience related to all things Islandora. And Dan has led uh, Islandora-themed presentations to group, groups all over the world. So I'll, without further ado, pass things over to Dan. Welcome, Dan. Hi. Um, we'll be doing a couple of things that we'll be showing in the slides, but uh, a lot of this will be hands-on. I'm going to all tab out of this in a second, and uh, we'll be playing around with some things on the on on our sandbox site. Um, but before we do that, just a little overview of rules, what it is, how it works. Rules I think of as kind of the hidden gem in Islandora. I honestly, most of the organizations, even the people who have steeped themselves into Islandora for a very long time, I don't even know if they know that it's there. And if they do, I don't really see anybody using it. And yet this is, for people that don't want to do custom development work, this is the single most powerful tool that you have at your disposal. Um, how do we look slides here? That, there we go. Sure, good enough. Uh, how do rules work? Uh, rules are simple. They are uh, a series of, or there's a definition of a way to react to an event. I say an event. It's possible to get it to react to multiple events, but generally, you're reacting to a single event. You're filtering down the ability to act upon that event by a series of conditions, one or more. You're possibly joining these conditions together using uh, statements that you might be familiar with from searching, like and or or, or you might be telling uh, the rule definition that you don't want to act on this condition by using a not. And then once you filter down based on that, con that condition or series of conditions, you're taking an action of some kind. So the example underneath here, uh, you can take an action on the event of the ingest of a data stream. You can say, I would like to do something because a data stream has been ingested. It's possible to filter down that reaction by the data stream's ID, so you can say, I only actually want to react to a data stream ingested when it has a specific identifier. And then you're able to take an action such as, uh, there are some simple actions that are provided to you through Drupal, such as notifying a specific user by an email address or notifying the administrative user. Uh, there are also 
specific actions that come with Islandora, and uh, we will get into those. In order to do this, I mentioned that uh, at the bottom here that you need to have rules admin enabled. So rules comes in sort of two pieces. There's the actual rules module, which allows you to create and uh, use rules and rules definitions. But then there's an also other separate module called rules admin, or if you're looking in the interface, it's called rules UI, which is what allows you to actually create or modify or manage rules that are in place. Uh, and you'll see at the bottom it says that's available to you at admin slash config slash workflow slash rules on whatever your site is once that uh, is enabled. It doesn't mention there, but it's also the case that there are a couple of permissions associated with rules for being able to modify them. So if you find yourself unable to access that page, you may want to go over to the permissions and make sure that all the rules permissions are checked off. Um, so. Let's jump into this with this example that I've given here. Ingesting a data stream, filtering by a data stream's ID, and notifying a user by email. Um, I just all command tab out of this. That should bring up the, uh, or we might possibly have to exit presentation mode here. There we go. OK, let's pop over to the Islandora on demand site, and let's try and actually create this rule that I've defined over here. If we want to react when a data stream is ingested. We want to specifically say that that data stream has a particular identifier, and we want to take an action to, I'm just going to say we're going to email the administrative email address for the site. So here's our uh, Discovery Garden sandbox site that we have up. The rules configuration is up here at the top under the general configuration. There's a section called workflow. And inside the workflow section, we have, this is the rules admin or the rules UI modules doing. You also notice that there's a couple of rules that are in here by default. It's possible to do a few different things when you create a module, such as um, to have a rule be imported. You'll notice that uh, rules can be imported and rules can be exported. And if you click on export, it will simply give you a definition of a rule that kind of looks like this. And it's possible to export that, copy into a file. If I go back, it's also possible to import a rule the exact same way. You just paste everything that was in there into there. And uh, it's possible to import rules that way. It's also possible to build modules that have default rules. And so some of the modules that come with uh, some of the Islandora modules or some of the modules that do come with Islandora have default rules in them, such as these one, uh, admi emailing administrators or uh, lifting embargoes or lifting embargoes on a data stream. As a matter of fact, if you have the Islandora Scholar embargo module enabled and if you're using that, rules is actually the way that embargo lifts data streams on things. It reacts to regular events uh, inside Islandora and makes some checks to see if the embargo should be lifted, and then it does. So rules is kind of in place as a, a way to do a few different things in Islandora, but we're going to create a new one to do this, uh, the, the rule that I described here, our data stream ingested one. There's an add new rule button up at the top. If I click on that, it'll bring us to a place where we can define an event and give it a name. So I'm going to call it email administrator. Um, and I said we were going to filter this by a specific data stream identifier. So I'm going to say OBJ. When we ingest an object that has an OBJ data stream, we want to notify the administrator. So ingest it. In the drop-down menu down here, we're able to react on events. You'll notice there's a whole bunch of events, and a lot of them just come with Drupal. Uh, a lot of them come with a whole bunch of different modules in Drupal, or in Drupal rather, like the node module or taxonomies, uh, users, and things like that. Um, these, th I guess, four sections that we have here all come with different parts of uh, Islandora. We have the Scholar IP embargo ones, and then up here we have ones that are just for plain old Islandora. There are six of them here, three for objects and three for data streams, and 
in each section, we have the ability to react when things are ingested, when things are modified, and when things are purged. So I'm going to click on data stream ingested because that's what he said we were going to do. So I want to react when a data stream is ingested. We'll save that. And when I save that, it'll bring me to the actual rules configuration interface. You'll see there's three sections here, one called events, one called conditions, and one called actions. Those are the three uh, sections that I mentioned before. And we can add as many things as we want into each of these sections. So uh, before we get into that, I'll, uh, I just want to demonstrate uh, the next slide that we have over here, which is going to talk about tokens. Let me switch over to the other tab here. Um, and we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll answer some questions once we get to the end here, but uh, thanks for popping that in the chat. I'm just going to switch over to the next thing here. Uh, rules create tokens. So this is what makes rules so incredibly powerful, is you're not only reacting to things that happen, but when you react to something that happens, Rules has access to all the information about that thing that it's reacting to. And it does that by way of tokens. Tokens are, as it says at the top, they are placeholders for information that we've obtained from an event or an action. And they're used to provide that information to other events or actions uh, that will happen during the course of using rules. I'll show you how that works. So we have a rule here right now where we've ingested a data stream, but if you remember, we want to be able to specifically say that we have ingested an OBJ data stream. Right now, this is reacting for every single data stream that could possibly be ingested. Uh, I can filter down to a specific data stream identifier by adding a condition. And that's this middle section here where we have conditions. So I can say add a condition, and this is going to bring us to a drop-down menu where I tell it what kind of condition I want to add. If you look in here, we have some specific to Islandora. We actually have three. We have the ability to check for a match using XPath and then XML data stream. We can check an object for a relationship, and we can check an object for the existence of a data stream. We also have at the top a bunch of data comparison, and these are just kind of generic ones where we can ask for information about tokens that we have. So when we react to a data stream being ingested, we gain a token inside our rule that contains all the information about that data stream. So we can actually do a data comparison on uh, information inside this data stream. So let's actually do that. We're just going to do a data comparison on, if I continue here, we have a data selector section here. And actually, there's a little lovely drop down menu if we uh, go in here. This contains all of the tokens that we currently have. So all rules have access to some generic site information, like uh, the site's site-wide email, the site's URL. Uh, the current user logged in or the current dates, things like that. Uh, but since we have a data stream that we're ingesting and an object that we're ingesting uh, that data stream into, we also have tokens that represent those two things. And you'll notice if I click on like the object, we have access to information about the object identifier, its label, owner, state, uh, what content models we have. We have access to all kinds of information. We don't necessarily know what that information is going to be. That's why we're doing the data comparison. So what I actually want is I want the information about the data stream. And specifically, I want to know what the data stream's identifier is, which is right here. So I'm doing a comparison on the data stream's identifier. I want to know something about it. If I continue, it gives me another screen where it uh, allows me to configure what that comparison is going to be. I want to say that uh, the data stream identifier is going to precisely equal something. And the value of the thing that I want to compare it to is the letters O, B, e, J. So all of this puts together, excuse me, all of this put together means that we're taking this data stream that we've ingested, we are asking what the identifier of the data stream is. 
we are comparing it to something else using an equals sign. And the thing that we're comparing it to is the letters OBJ. Put all that together and we get a statement of a condition saying, is the identifier of this data stream OBJ? That's our condition. I go down to the bottom here. Uh, you'll also notice that there is a checkbox that says negate. This is our not, if you're familiar with that in search terms. If I check that off, I'm asking that the uh, data stream ID is not OBJ. Currently, I'm asking if it is, but I can also ask if it's not. And I can ask if pretty much anything is not something. We'll save that. So now we are reacting when a data stream has been ingested, and we are doing a comparison of the data stream's identifier to the letters OBJ. So we're saying if this data stream that was ingested was an OBJ data stream, then what are we going to do? Well, that's what happens in the action section down here. I'm going to add an action. And I believe the action that I said we were going to do is we were going to email the site-wide administrator, which is actually one of the actions available to us down here. You know, as we go through that there are some Islandora specific actions, again, there are some kind of neat ones, actually. Uh, it's possible to add or remove relationships from an object. It's possible to load a data stream from an object. Uh, we can do, and I'll try to get into this, I really hope we have enough time, because this is neat stuff. Uh, we can do some DOM XPath, like we can query XML inside a data stream. So we can look for values, and then we have those values available to us. Uh, we can lift an embargo, I guess, if you want to do that. And then we can do some stuff with ExactMol, which I also hope to be able to get into. Uh, we can load ExactMol save ExactMol, and while we have that ExactMol loaded, we can modify it. But all we want to do right now is down in the system section, I want to send mail. And who are we sending it to? Well, we could stick a specific email address in here, like I could stick my own CA. I could do that. But remember, I said we want to send that email to the site-wide administrator. Well, I don't know off the top of my head what the site-wide or the site-wide administrator is, but rules knows what it is. So rather than typing in an email address at the right, I can click this button that says switch to data selection, and instead of sticking in a value. I'm switched over to this data selector where I'm able to select information again from the tokens that we have available to us. You might remember we have site-wide tokens available to us, and one of those is the site's uh, administrative email address. So I can just, rather than uh, typing in an email address specifically, I can just do that. Uh, you may also notice that um, under site, there is the current user, and the current user also has an email address. So it would be possible to also send an email to the user who is currently logged in, and that would be the user who is ingesting this data stream. So it's possible to send an email to them too, but I just want to send one to the site-wide administrator, so I'll use that. Uh, we can, there's fields here, well I scrolled down way too fast, here we go. There's a fields here for the subject and body of the message. So I'm going to put it in a subject of OBJ ingested with an exclamation point because that's great. Uh, the mail's message body. Um, we can put some things in here. Hi, you ingest, uh, I'm not going to say you, this is the site-wide administrator. A uh, new OBJ has been ingested. Now, this uh, message is not exactly very exciting. There's not much to it. But you'll notice below here, we have a list of replacement patterns. So these same patterns like site colon mail that function up here in data selectors, we can also stick those into a section like this. If I drop down here, look, we have all kinds of them. So that same site email that we have, 
we can stick that in here by using a token pattern like this. Actually, we can do interesting things like, say, the currently logged in user. So we can tell the administrator that such and such a user has in, been uh, ingesting OBJ. So we can say a new OBJ has been ingested by, I'll paste that in, the current user. So when the email gets sent out, that's going to be replaced by that current user's name. We can also say something like the time it was ingested was, and then we have, if I scroll down a little bit, we have the uh, current date and time is available to me. So I can go back up and paste that in there. And I can also say something about the object or the data stream itself. I can say, for example, the PID of the object it was ingested into was, and you might notice if I scroll down enough here, we have replacement patterns for the ingested object. I can take the object's identifier or the object's label. Actually, I can take all kinds of things about it but I can put that in here. I can say the pit of the object it was ingested into was identifier of the object. In parentheses, I can put something more descriptive like the object label is available to me. That seems like enough information to send to an administrator if they want to know something about a, an object that had a data stream ingested into it. I don't have to fill out the from. Uh, it's possible to just leave that as a site-wide address. I don't have to fill out the language specified either. That's simply if you need to uh, do translations on specific things, uh, it's possible to specify exactly which translation you're going to use. But I'm just going to save that as it is right now. So we now have a rule. The rule reacts when a data stream has been ingested. It runs a comparison on information to ask what the ID of the data stream is and tries to compare it to the letters OBJ. And if it gets a match, it sends an email to the site-wide administrator, which contains a body with a whole bunch of information that uh, we've pulled out of tokens that we have available to us and sends it off to the site administrator. So, you can kind of see how this can be used to build your site's workflows. Um, this is a very, very simple rule, but it's also possible to do other things you may have noticed, such as set an object's state. So it may be possible to, or well, it may, I say it may be possible, it is definitely possible, but you may want to do things like setting an object's state to inactive, or setting a specific set of exact policies on an object or do other things uh, before you notify such and such a user. And it's possible to do that all through rules. And we'll, uh, we, we have time here, so hopefully we'll get into some of the more complicated things. I wanted to, the next thing we need to go over here uh, after we talk about tokens is the fact that rules can be chained. And it says specifically here, actions can be chained. You may have noticed uh, that when we were creating our, um, when we were creating some things here, it is possible for those uh, actions to provide us with things. So I'm gonna do an action. Well, let's save the changes here. And, leave this email administrator on OBJ ingested. Go back to the rules here. So let's think of another possible uh, interesting thing that we might want to be able to do with rules that might require chaining actions. Uh, I've got a couple of ideas here. Um, ah, yes, here's a good one. So you know how the, you may or may not know that uh, the standard method of providing a label for an object is to just pull it out of the XML uh, that was ingested with that object. And there's a whole bunch of ways to get that, but you may want to choose a different thing for your label if, uh, if an object fulfills certain sets of conditions. So let's do that as an example of chaining together um, 
actions. You'll notice that uh, when you're creating actions, that actions can provide tokens. So it's possible to do multiple actions independent of each other when you create a single rule. But because some actions provide tokens, and also because there are some actions that simply provide tokens, that's all that they do. They don't do anything else. They just provide you with some sort of information. It's possible to do a series of actions in which you get information and then do something using that information and then possibly save something back to uh, an object or other things. These are actions that can be chained together by gathering information and modifying it. You also notice when we made the last rule that we did that we used a data type. I'm just going to go back into this quickly so we can see. We made a data comparison. Uh, data type conditions and actions exist sort of independently from other, any other thing. It's just data. It just wants to know something. So we can load or modify information that's in tokens. Uh, it's not specifically doing anything with an island or object. It's just data. It's information that we have. Because we're getting data or modifying data, we can provide that data that we've gotten or modified to future actions. And uh, doing that allows us to chain them together. We'll show you how this works with uh, loading, we're going to say loading the mods data stream from a, uh, an object and using that to set the label, using some sort of information that we find in the mods data stream to set the label. So I'm going to add a new rule. This rule will also, well, I'll give it a name first. Um, update labels, label, label, from mods, label. Good gracious, typing is hard. I'm going to react on the event that a specific, uh, that an object has been ingested. And from here, we're going to say that we will look for a mods data stream and then load the mods data stream if it's there. So I'm reacting when an object has been ingested. And I have a condition. I want there to actually be a mods data stream on this object. So I can do that by adding a condition You'll notice under here, there is a condition that checks an object for the existence of a data stream. That's something that I'm able to do. Uh, the object that was ingested is available to me as a token just by the fact that we are creating a rule that reacts when an object has been ingested. This is that object that's been ingested, and we can do things with that. I'm looking for a specific data stream. The specific data stream that I'm looking for is called MODS. And that's all there is to it. I'm looking inside this object, and I'm asking for a data stream that's called mods. I'll save that. And now we have our condition. Now we are safe to go rooting around inside the mods and seeing what's in there. So first thing I'm going to do is add an action here. I'm going to add an action that loads DOM X path for a given data stream. You also notice there's one here for loading it from a given XML that it's possible to just type XML outright that possibly contains tokens in it and things like that. But we want the actual XML content of the mods data stream. We're going to load Dobbin path from a data stream. And the data stream is going to be, oh, goodness, I'm sorry. I had this all written out, but uh, I forgot the first step here. We actually do have to load the data stream first. And then we can load the Dom X path from it. This is why I was doing this in the chaining section, and now this all makes sense to me. Uh, so first step here, we're going to load the actual data stream from the object. And that data stream ID is going to be MODS, and it's going to provide us with a variable. You'll notice down at the bottom here. This is where we get our token. Uh, and we get to name our token. We get to pick, decide what it's called. So. I will call it loaded mods and the variable name instead of data stream, I'm just going to call it mods. We'll save that. So now we've loaded a data stream and we have the mods data stream available to us. You also notice here it said that it provides a variable of mods. This is our loaded mods that we put in. We can now uh, load a DOMX path instance from that mods. If I go down here, 
load a DOM XPath from a data stream, and we're able to select the mods. We're able to throw that into our data selector, and it's there available for us. Uh, same thing, that mods that we've uh, loaded into DOM XPath allows us to, or gives us a variable of some kind. I'm going to name it so that it's uh, more sensible for us to look at. We'll call it mods XPath. And variable name, I will also call it mods um, just as a piece of information you may or may not know, what we're doing here, XPath, in case you may be unfamiliar with it, is a query language that allows us to search inside XML. So what we're doing is we're loading the mods data stream, and then we're sticking it into something that we can query. That's this mods XPath. And then what we're going to do after this is we're going to actually query it. Uh, you may also know, notice, I'm going to add an action here. This is our third action that we're chaining together. You may also notice that there is a register namespaces on a DOM XPath instance. So uh, we may find it necessary to actually load or to actually register the mods namespace here. Namespaces are registered from a taxonomy. We don't have a taxonomy here, uh, but we can create one fairly easy. And I'm going to do that very quickly in a separate tab here. Um, if I go to structure, let me open structure in a new tab. Uh, in the taxonomy section, we can add a vocabulary. I'm going to call this vocabulary uh, mods namespaces. And this is just going to be a vocabulary of mods, mods, excuse me, mods namespaces that we need. The only one we're actually going to need is the regular old mods namespace. So I'm going to add a term to this mods namespaces vocabulary. The name that we add here is the actual uh, namespace uh, placeholder that we want to put in. I'm going to call it mods. And the description down here is the URI that that uh, namespace actually points to. So I'm going to call it www.loc.gov slash standards slash mods slash three. And that's our mods namespace. Let me just save this. So now we have a taxonomy that defines all the namespaces we're going to need while we're working with mod. So if I go back over here to our add a new action, uh, it's not available to us. It's not available to us yet. But if I go back in here and try again to the namespaces on a DOM XPath instance, we're registering this on our mods XPath. And we are using the mods namespaces that we just created, that mods and uh, URI pairing. So I'm going to save that. And now the third thing that it's going to do is register namespaces so that it's able to uh, correctly search inside the mods. Fourth thing we're going to do is now that we have a loaded data stream, now that we have a DOM X path for that data stream, and now that we've registered namespaces, we can query nodes, which is where we actually write out our XPath and go searching for something. So I'm going to search inside that mods XPath, and this is the section, section where we're able to specify the exact XPath query that I want to do. I'm just going to do a simple one here. We're going to look for mods title info mods. It's mods colon title. Uh, you'll remember this is the namespace that we gave it here, mods. That's everything before the colon. And we're just looking inside mods for the mods title info element. And underneath that, we're looking for the mods title element. So we're querying whatever, whatever is in there. Uh, we may pos It is possible to have a context node, like we, if we did a query beforehand that gave us a specific node, it's possible to say that we're starting from that node instead of starting 
from the document root. So if we had one of those, we could stick it in here, but we don't, so I'm gonna leave that blank. You'll notice again that this provides us a variable. Uh, it says query DOM node element, and it is a list of nodes. I'm gonna give that a different name so that it's uh, easier to tell. Mods title nodes. And I'm going to call it that, mods title node, so that when we're looking at it later, uh, it makes sense. I'm going to save that. Oh, I put dashes in it. Sorry, I'm supposed to be putting underscores in there. Let me just switch that out. Mods underscore title underscore nodes. That's better. Okay, so now we have loaded a data stream. We have turned it into an XPath query, uh, queryable document. We have registered the namespaces that we need to on that. We have queried for the title from it. And now finally, we're able to do something with the titles that we've queried. I'm gonna add an action. And what we're going to do is we're going to go in the data section and we are going to set a data value because what I want to do with this information that I found is I want to set the label of the object that we have. So I'm going to set a data value and the data value that I'm going to set is in the ingested object and it is the object label. Let me continue here. Um, inside here, I'm going to give it a value, and I'm going to give it a value from our data selector. So we have that uh, mods title nodes selector that's available to us. Um, you'll notice here that there's a list that we have, zero, one, two, three. This is because it's possible for us in a list to have any number of things. We could have uh, only one title node found, but we could have you know, seven or 20 title nodes found. Realistically, we're probably only just going to have one and we're gonna want the first one that we have uh, available to us. Um, so this is saying that take the first title node that you find and use the text contents of that uh, title node as the label. So we have our list of title nodes that we found we have the zeroth one, which is our first one, and we have the text content of that node. We're taking that information and we're setting the object label as that. So by chaining all of these things together, each of these provides a variable of some, well, except for the registering namespaces, but most of these provide us with a variable of some kind. And by chaining those together, we can load a data stream, do things with the data stream, load things from the loaded data stream, mess around with things that we have on the object or the data stream, we can query it, we can do all sorts of things. We can do things with the results of our query. We do all that by chaining together all of the actions that we have. So all together, what this particular rule is going to do is anytime an object is ingested, it's going to look at that object and ask whether it has a mods data stream. If it doesn't, it's not gonna do anything. If it does though, it's going to load that mods data stream, turn it into a DOM XPath uh, object, which allows us to query it using XPath. It's going to register a series of namespaces on there. Realistically, the only one that's gonna register is mods because that's the only one that we defined, but that's what it's going to do. We are going to query inside the mods and ask for the title using XPath. And then we are going to set the object label to whatever the first result we find is. And if it doesn't find any results, it's just going to set it to blank because that's all we have. I'm gonna save that. And now we have two rules. Boy, this is great. Um, we have a few other interesting things that we want to do here. Uh, that's chaining actions. The third thing that I wanted to bring up in the list here uh, on this next lovely slide is that the fact, the fact that components are able to encapsulate rule sets. You may have noticed while we were looking at this screen that we have a tab on the main rules section called components. So you may find yourself using a set of rules over and over and over again, or you may find that you want to 
join together a whole bunch of rules and then join together a whole bunch of other rules or conditions, things like that. So it's possible to create components because you may find yourself doing things over and over again that you don't want to do over and over again. For example, remember when we were making this uh, update the label from mods thing last time? Um, this, the loading a data stream from an object, loading DOM X path from a data stream, registering namespace on the DOM X path instance, and querying nodes inside that DOM X path instance, that's four things that we had to add into this action. And if we ever want to do an action that's similar to this again, we're going to have to make up that entire set of actions again. We may not want to do that over and over and over again. We may want to be able to do this across multiple rules and just have one encapsulated component that defines the ability to load a data stream, load XPath, register namespaces, and query nodes. We also may have multiple conditions. Um, I actually put these on the slide. This is a fairly common example of a set of conditions that you might want to link together. We want to know that the object contains a data stream and we want to know that the object contains a data stream with a specific DSID, and we want to know that the object is in the active state rather than the inactive or deleted state, and we might want to know that the object is owned by a certain person, and we may only want to react based on whether that's happened. So it's possible from the components section to join together a whole bunch of uh, conditions or actions that we want to do over and over again, like uh, that. The first thing we set is how we're going to link all these together. In the case that I gave, we want to link all them together with and because we want to know that all of them actually happened. But it's also possible to link them together with or so that we can say one of these happened or another one or a different one. We get into the and one because we want all of them to be the case. We give it a name and we give it a set of variables that we need. So object is okay. I don't exactly know what we're going to call this, but that'll have to do. Uh, while we're messing around with this, we're uh, going to have some variables that need to be uh, put in. These are where we choose things that may not be consistent across all usages of this particular component. Uh, in this case, we may want to be able to specify which user that uh, we're going to want to, uh, when we said that the object needed to be owned by a specific user, we may want to specify which user that was each time we use this component. So, um, I'm going to go through here, and we have some entities like an island or a data stream. Uh, we have a user is another type of entity. And do we need anything else from here? Uh, we do. We need the object. Uh, I guess if we're saying that it's in the active state all the time, we don't really need uh, that. We can say data stream is the label. Data stream is the machine name. User and user is uh, our other data type that we're using here, the user that we want to check uh, whether or not they own this. I'm going to continue. From here, all we're going to do is set up a set of conditions exactly the same as we did before. The only difference is we have a whole bunch of sort of empty tokens available to us. We have a data stream and a user that are available to us. And anytime somebody uses this component, they have to define where that uh, user is coming from and where that data stream is coming from. So I'm going to add one condition in here. Uh, the condition that we wanted is we're saying that uh, the user, the conditions that we have in here, the object is owned by a specific user contains a data stream with DSID. So we're going to do a data comparison here by example. We're going to say that the data stream that we ha have access to, the ID is a specific type of ID, let's say VJ, just as an example. 
So now we're checking as a part of this component to see if the data stream uh, that we have is called OBJ. We can add more conditions into this component. And then once we have all those conditions together, uh, we can go back to a rule of some kind. And rather than specifying when we add a condition that uh, we want to add a whole bunch of specific conditions, we can add a component, which is all of our conditions uh, joined together. We can stick that in instead. And uh, we, uh, you'll remember the data stream and user that we said that we were going to have. We need to uh, plug in here. Uh, by default, it uses the current user of the site, but we also want to be able to plug in the object and data stream that we had. Um, it doesn't quite work for this one because we're loading uh, a user, but if we did this with the other rule that we created, we would have that data stream available to us. Um, so by chaining together a bunch of conditions, we're able to do the, the create rules that are very similar but differentiate slightly between implementations, uh, and we're able to just make the process of making rules a little bit easier uh, by chaining all of those, uh, or by chaining conditions together, or by chaining actions together, so that you don't have to do it every time. Uh, to finish off here, I had a whole bunch of examples of some advanced techniques. Uh, we're not going to go over all of them, and actually we've done a couple of them here, but uh, such as the creating a label on an object using uh, xQuery. But you'll notice we also have another couple of things to us, such as or available to us, such as Xactimal or the content models of an object. I'm actually going to go over here and, and show you a couple of these. Um, so it's possible to, when we're looking for a specific content model on an object, uh, we are looking for a condition inside a list. So we're not doing a data comparison. We're uh, saying that a list contains a specific item, and the item that we're looking for is the content model. Uh, we're doing, we're looking inside the object models list, and we're looking for a specific content model. Uh, I'm going to switch to direct input so we can specify the content model that we're using. Specify, excuse me, a content model like Islandora um, SP basic image, I believe is the basic image content model. So we can say that we're only actually going to do this rule when the content model of the object is basic image. And we can do that by looking inside the list of models and checking for the value island or SP basic image. Um, I don't know if we have much time left. We're hitting very close to the end of it. Um, I didn't want to leave room for questions. I don't know how many we have. Sure. But if not, then we can quickly take a look at example. But that's only if we have that chance. I think we'll uh, open the floor to any questions just to make sure that we get uh, uh, them answered in the time that we have allocated here today. Um, so with that, uh, as I mentioned, you're all on mute. So if you could type any questions into the chat window, I'll read them out and Dan can have, uh, have a look at them. So there's already some in there. Um, oh, Why did I select data stream yeah. ingested and not object ingested? Uh, it honestly, it depends entirely on what you are planning to do. Um, so the problem with selecting object ingested, I'll just show this very quickly. Um, it's impossible to know from this point what data streams are going to be on an object once it's ingested. We don't have access to that information. So if I added a new rule called a bunch of letters and we react when a data stream has been ingested, we have access to the data streams, or I'm sorry, I, that was not the, uh, I intended to click on object ingested. Let me quickly add an event here. Object ingested. So you'll see under the actions and conditions, um, actually I'll add a uh, loaded data stream action. 
So I can say I would like to load a data stream from the object. And we have this object here that we've ingested, but we don't have access to any of the data streams inside it. So we're not able to do anything with the data streams. We're only able to really do things with the object itself. If we wanted to do things with the data streams, excuse me, we would have to react when the data stream itself has been ingested, just to make sure that we have access to that. Um, otherwise, you're limiting, it's, it's a limitation of the uh, tokens that are available to you at any specific time, whether you have information about the object or whether you have the actual data stream itself. Um, Viewer46 asks, uh, is it possible to add a new event via a module we made ourselves? It actually is, and that's the uh, reason that we have these Islandora rules. Uh, these rules are provided by the Islandora module. Uh, the, the object ingested and the data stream ingested ones, things like that. Those are all provided by the Islandora module, uh, and they're provided essentially in code. Um, things like data streams and objects are considered to be entities by Drupal. They're not complete entities in the sense that Drupal stores them in the database and knows what to do with them. They're entities in the sense that they have a definition and they have information about them. And all of that information is defined in code by Islandora. How to modify the information and get the information is also defined in code by Islandora. And all of those actions that you can take, like writing to data streams and writing to ExactMol and all of those different things, uh, XQuery, whatever, those are also all defined by Islandora in code. If you want to take a look and see if you can figure it out for yourself, which is kind of what my process in this has been, there is a file in the Islandora module called islandora.rules.inc, which contains all of the implementations of rules that Islandora uses in order to achieve these things. Um, it's also, just to make sure I cover all the bases in this, in this question, uh, it's also possible to create a module that defines rules definitions. Like when I export one of these rules, like this one, this gigantic rules definition here is possible to import uh, using, oh, I think the rules default hook, so that when you enable the module, uh, all of these rules are imported and they can be enabled or disabled by default. Um, so it's possible to do that as well. And that's where the ones that come with Islandora come from. That's where the ones that come with the uh, Scholar Embargo come from as well. It's just imported default rules. All right, so with that, uh, I think that's all the time we have questions, or all the questions we have time for today. Um, we're gonna go back to the slides for one second. And I wanted to bring this to your attention. Uh, coming up in November, on November 30th, at the New York Academy of Medicine, uh, we're going to be hosting a Hello Islandora, building a digital repository session. Uh, it's going to be led by Aaron Tripp, business development manager here at Discovery Garden. And I will include some information and a link to that uh, in the follow-up email later on today. So with that, uh, thank you very much, Dan. Certainly to learn a lot every time we go through these. Who knew? <laughs> It was great. Uh, so if there's any follow-up questions after the fact, then uh, you know please email me and uh, I'll put them in front of Dan and we'll get your answer to you. Other than that, uh, we look forward to our next webinar in October. And thank you very much for joining. Bye-bye.